evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another evening of Bible study here at MOMBC Online. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you, God, for allowing our hearts and our souls to be open to receive this wonderful truth that you have just for us, not so that we can keep it to ourselves, but so that we can tell somebody else about you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To God be the glory. So we are right back in Genesis chapter number 25 as we uh, uh, have been talking about Abraham's call, Abraham's family, the Lord making promises that Abraham was going to be blessed and descendants were going to be blessed. And then uh, on last week, I talked about the fact that uh, we got into talking about last two weeks, we were talking about how uh, Jacob, excuse me, Isaac uh, has been called to continue this fulfillment of God's promise. And so Isaac gets married at 40 years old, but the wife that he marries is barren. And so he goes to the Lord and he says, look, Lord, I need you to work this thing out. I know what you did for my mother. I know what you did for my father. So I know that you're able to do it for my wife so that we can fulfill the promise that you gave to my father. And then the Bible, as the Bible gives it to us, as the scriptures uh, relay it, she conceives. Uh, and then there's a, a struggle going on uh, within her. The Lord says unto her, there's two nations in your womb. The elder is going to serve the younger. Or in verse number 23, the uh, older will serve the younger. Uh, and then we talked about how they got their names. Esau, because of his physical attributes. Jacob, because of what he does. The fact that he was grasping on to something. And then the ending of verse number 26 says that Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Uh, if you don't read it in the context of the way, uh, if you don't read the whole context, we would assume and think that once Isaac prayed that the Lord immediately answered his prayer, she conceives and then she has a child by the time they turn 41 years old. But no, Isaac had to keep on praying for at least 20 years before she has this set of twins because Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. So, verse number 26 is where I want to start and keep going. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 26. Oh, this is good stuff to me. Pray the Lord. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 26. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman. Now, if you're highlighting in your Bible, if you're underlining, underlining in your Bible, things that nature, I want you to make sure you underline that part right there. That Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman. Okay, it's gonna make more sense in just a uh, 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 just a moment. But he was an expert hunter and outdoorsman. Okay. In, the, in a nomadic culture such as what they were living in, you know, they didn't have Walmarts, a family member who served as a hunter was important for the family's uh, livelihood. So the fact that he was an expert hunter, he didn't just go hunting, uh, you know, just because he felt like it because it was a sport. He went hunting because it was necessary in order for them to eat. People go hunting today because it is a sport. Because you know they they're not uh, they're not in uh, in a state or in a bed of you know having to survive. They're going hunting because it's the season for hunting that particular animal, and that's a you know a sport. But during this particular time, you know during the biblical days. 
they went hunting because there was no Walmart, there was no food lion, there was no uh, flea market to go to. They had to do something in order to survive. So the fact that he was an expert hunter says that he had knowledge of the land and its resources. <coughs> Excuse me. And considering, remember I said highlight that part, he was an expert hunter, he was an outdoorsman, it should be difficult to pull a fast one on him because he's an expert in hunting. You're an expert in knowing how uh, to move at just the right pace. You're an expert at knowing uh, not to, to make uh, the make a whole lot of noise when you're walking on the leaves and things of that nature. I've never hunted before in my life, but one of the things that is always funny to me, uh, I've told y'all before that the Cosby Show will always be one of my favorite TV shows. Always. I'm telling you what's true. I don't care what uh, Bill, I don't care what Bill Cosby does. I don't care what Felicia Rashad does. I don't care what any of them do. The Cosby Show itself will always be one of my favorite shows. One of the episodes they were trying to surprise Heathcliff Huxtable. And he told them, you will never surprise me. I will always find out. And one of the things that happens with my son, Jeremy, is he's always trying to scare me. He's always trying to startle me. But the thing that happens is... He's too noisy. <laughs> you can't scare somebody and you're going to be noisy. You, you can't sneak up on somebody and they hear you walking down the hallway. They hear you walking around the corner. You've got to be quieter when you're trying to, you got to be very quiet when you're trying to scare somebody. And so every time he tries to scare me, it upsets him because he's like, oh, man, I was trying to scare you. Why don't you ever get scared? And I said, well, Jeremy, it really is hard to scare me. It's really hard to startle me. I don't know why, but, it, you know, not just because, you know, he's noisy, but it, it's just it's hard to, you know, startle me to a point that I, I'm scared or what have you. And, and so I, I'm always reminded of, you know, the, ex, the episode of the Cosby Show when he could was saying, you'll never surprise me. And I've told Jeremy sometimes, like, look, bro, you, I don't know that you'll ever be able to scare me. I, I said, I just don't know that you'll ever be able to do that because I, I'm just, I, I, I'm always, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just very alert of my surroundings most of the time, most of the time. I'm, I'm usually alert of my surroundings. I, I told my mama one time, I said, I'm the guy that when I walk into a new place, there's two things that I look for. One, where the bathroom is, and two, what's the next closest uh, exit out of here? If the exit that I came in is not a good exit, you know, if something happens, I need to know where's the next good exit that I can get to quickly. But my point to this is, this guy is an expert hunter. So you would think he knows how to, you know, see if a fast one is being pulled over him. Okay? I want you to note that as we keep going. The second part of verse number 27 says, Although Esau was an expert hunter and an outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. King James Version calls it a plain man. Uh, yeah, King James Version calls it a plain man. And one meaning of the Hebrew word translated here as plain describes a guiltless and upright person who was not liable for wrongdoing. Its usage regarding Jacob was an ironic descriptor considering that his future actions were anything but guiltless. A plain, uh, a plain person or a quiet person was one who was uh, described as guiltless and upright and not liable for wrongdoing. If you highlighted or underlined, 
I underline it, you're going to need to make sure you highlight, underline that part as well. That not only that, that Esau was an, an, an expert hunter, make sure you underline that adjective, expert, not just any old type of hunter, not a, a, a casual hunter, not a, a casual thing. Uh, you, uh, let, let me say one little piece about that uh, to bring it closer to home as well. Expert Hunter says that you are skilled in the area that you are uh, doing this particular thing. I call, <laughs> we have a member of our church that I call an expert shopper. She is an expert bargain shopper. This woman can go, she can sniff a bargain clearance rack anywhere. And, and, and so she'll say, I'm going to get such and such. And I say, okay, no problem. And I laugh because I'm like, I know that you're not going to pay that much for it. I, I know that you're going to find stuff on clearance. I call her an expert shopper. I am not an expert shopper. I shop when I need to. I shop when I got some money and I'm able to go shop. I shop when, okay, I need a new pair of pants. Okay, I need to go to the store. I need to get a new pair of pants. But this woman, she doesn't, you know, she when she shops, she's able to shop in a way that she can get stuff that she needs now and stuff that she knows that she may need for later or she can be able to bless somebody else. But she knows she can get a good deal on it right now. She's an expert shopper. Esau was an expert hunter. He was good at what he did. Did Jacob was described as a quiet man or a plain man who stayed at the house. And a quiet or plain man was described as someone was get that guiltless or upright who was not liable for wrongdoing. But that's going to make more sense in just a minute. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number 28. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. Okay, favoritism is shown here. Lord have mercy. You know, I, I, I talked about this uh, one time before in Bible study where I was talking about Joseph, uh, one of Jacob's son, and how uh, Jacob loved uh, Joseph more than the other brothers, and that caused uh, his brothers to be jealous of him. And here we see that the favoritism, and I talked about this before, how the favoritism did not start with Jacob. The favoritism actually went back years before that, generations before that, because here it is with Isaac, uh, Isaac and Rebekah, because Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. He was a hunter. He was an outdoorsman. So he related to him more. But Rebecca loved Jacob. So she favored Jacob more because he stayed at the house. Okay. Uh, he, he, he stayed at the house and, and, you know, and, and some folks will say he learned how to cook. Okay. He, he, he learned how, he learned how to take care of the house. He, he learned one of the things that my grandma said, uh, one time she, she got four children. Uh, my mama, two other aunts and my uncle. Alpha is the only boy. And she said, but all my children know how to keep house. All my children know how to wash clothes. All my, I, I, I learned all my children. You know, the season say, they, they didn't say I taught all my children. I learned all my children how to wash their own clothes, how to cook, how to do, you know, how to take care of the house so that if he ain't got a woman, he know how to take care of himself. Lord have mercy. And so in the same way, Jacob learned how to take care of stuff in the house. Verse number 29, once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted, okay? <laughs> once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted, okay? The stew or the sod pottage, uh, the stew by it consisted of some herbs, some vegetables and some lentils. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Esau, you know, it was natural for him to come in from the field exhausted because he was an expert hunter. Uh, 
Uh, Jacob was managing the chores around the camp, including the meal preparation. Okay, again, remember I said, you know, he knew how to take care of the house. Okay, as a result of all Esau's hard work in the field, he was exhausted. Okay, he, 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 he was to the point where he was about to perish in his mind. Verse number 30, verse number 29, verse number 30, he said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. That is why he was also named Edom. Now, if you watch last week's uh, Bible study lesson, I talked about the physical attributes of Esau and that his skin, his hair, or both appeared red, okay? And then the other uh, underlying Hebrew word sounded like the other nickname that was given to him, which was Edom, okay? And that's where we see it here. Uh, he is, uh, that he's called Edom because he says, come here and give me some of that red, I mean, you know, let me get some of that red stuff, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, give me some of that red stuff, okay? I, I'm hungry, man. I'm at the point of exhaustion. Now, Esau's descendants were the Edomites. And I, I'm going to get back to the importance of that pot, of, you know, that, that stew and Jacob and Esau and what he requested all that in just a moment. But let me deal with that Edom part just for a moment. Esau's descendants were the Edomites. They would eventually settle in, settle in the region of Seir, uh, east of Seir, east of the Dead Sea, during the era when kings ruled Israel, a constant state of tension and frequent warfare existed between the Edomites and the Israelites. Uh, as a result, God's promise to Rebekah regarding her sons came to pass. The descendants of her older son, Esau, would serve the descendants of her younger son. Remember, in verse number 22, when she went and inquired to the Lord why this struggle was going on within her, verse number 23, when the Lord answered her and said, two nations of you know, war are inside of your womb, not just two babies, but two nations, uh, two uh, two people will come from you and be separated. One is going to be stronger over the other and the older will serve the younger. Okay. The Edomites ended up serving the Israelites because of this war that started with the brothers. Now, it's important to note here that Esau says to Jacob, look, bruh, I'm starving I am at the point of exhaustion. Let me get some of that red stuff. Okay? He's begging. Instead of just saying, can I get something to eat? His uh, physical state of exhaustion has him in the state of begging. Can I please get some of that stuff? Sometimes, I, let me you know, use Jeremy again, because sometimes Jeremy will be at the point of begging to get something, and it's like, dude, it ain't that serious. It, you, you, you will be all right. And it's like, you can ask for stuff, but you can also beg for stuff. Here, Esau is begging for some of the stew that Jacob was preparing. Now, instead of, okay, I don't want to go, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Pray the Lord, hallelujah. Verse number 31, Genesis chapter 25. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. What? How? Okay, let's read Esau's response. Verse number 31. Verse 30, Esau said, let me get some of that red stuff. I'm at the point of exhaustion. Jacob says, well, uh, sell me your birthright first. What does a birthright got to do with some stew? Which is going to make sense to what Esau's response is in verse number 32. 
Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? I'm about to die. What I mean, I just want some stew. What does a birthright have to do with stew? Jacob said, verse number 33, swear to be first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, and went away. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, this is where we get into, uh, remember I said highlight this piece? I highlight the piece about the expert hunter and highlight the piece about the quiet man. Okay. First of all, Jacob, what stew got to do with a birthright? I, 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 uh, like, what? What? I'm confused. Why are you talking to me about a birthright when I'm hungry? You ever had a conversation with somebody and you ask them one thing and then they answer you and it has nothing to do with the question that you ask them to the point that you think to yourself, what? What are you talking about? I am so lost. Or you're talking to somebody and they start in the middle of the conversation. I have a very close person in my life that they could start in the middle of a conversation. I'm like, what? And then I'm like, oh, oh, oh you talk about da, 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 da. But I can, uh, I'm not the only one that can do that because I've been around this person so long. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But my point to this is that some people that you, you, you'll be talking to them and they'll just start like in the middle of a conversation and it's like, did I miss something? Were you supposed to tell me something that I didn't get or, uh, you know, and you just lost. That's how it was here. And so I can imagine Esau trying to figure out what does a birthright, how do we go from red stuff and a stew to a birthright? What do the two have to do with each other? But, but here's the problem that I have. Jacob, you're supposed to be a quiet man, right? You're supposed to not be liable for wrongdoing. So why would you bribe somebody that wants a pot of stew with a birthright? Why would you use, come on here now, why would you use something that has nothing to do with food in order to share what the Lord has gifted for you to do. You know, that unfortunately happens in today's life, that the enemy is tempting us with stuff, and he slides stuff up on the table, thinking that we're not going to notice, and most of the time we don't notice that. Not most of the time. Sometimes we really don't notice because we're not paying attention to his tricks and his, his schemes. And he is sliding that thing in there. And then we find ourselves caught up in something. We're like, what in the world? How did I get here? You remember when the enemy slipped that thing in and you won't pay attention because we were paying attention to uh, what was in front of us. And the enemy said, okay, I can slide this in. They ain't going to be thinking about it. That's what Jacob does. He allows the enemy to use him in such a way that he slides in there the birthright. He understands that there is a double portion of the father's estate if you have the birthright. Because the firstborn was uh, obligated to get that birthright. So there's a benefits package that comes with being the first right, uh, first uh, born. Isaac was a wealthy man. Therefore, the birthright, the father's estate, would have been quite sizable. And Jacob said, one day, I'm going to get my brother and I'm going to get that birthright. Don't nobody have to tell me about the fact that at the end of the day, my daddy got a whole lot of wealth and I'm going to get what is mine. I'm going to get that sizable birthright. Come on, get down. And so, but, and so, 
Contrary to him being a quiet man and plain and guiltless and not liable for wrongdoing, here he is performing trickery. Oh, shame, shame, shame. But on the other hand, you big dummy, as Fred Sanford used to say, Esau, you are a skilled expert hunter, and you gave up your birthright for a pot or a bowl of stew? What is wrong with you, man? If the two did not go together, if it did not make sense for a birthright to be sold in order to get a bowl of soup stew, why would you even consider it? And then he had the audacity to say that I'm at the point to I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? No, bruh. No, dude. Don't give up your birthright. Don't give up something that has nothing to do with food because your body is telling you that you about to die. Excuse me, I can almost guarantee you that the Lord going to provide another pot of stew for somebody else, but you going to sell a birthright in order to get one little bowl of soup? One little bowl of stew? What is... Bro, something must be really wrong with you. And then, and then it, it, you know, uh, it used to be... Uh, V8 used to have commercials all the time, and they would hit themselves in the forehead and say, duh, should have had a V8. Esau, you the, you, you the expert. What's wrong with you? That not only did you entertain what Jacob said about selling the birthright in order to get a bowl of stew, but then you go ask, did you go ask the, uh, did you go ask the question, well, what a birthright got to do with me? I'm about to die. I just need some stew. And then Jacob said, swear to me first, I give this bowl. I give you a bowl if you give me your birthright. Esau, it didn't make sense the first time. So why would you give it to him the, when he asked the second time? The first time he said, sell me your birthright, birthright, and I give you a, a bowl of stew. You say to him, well, what they got to do with each other? Then Jacob says to you again, look, all I want you to do is swear to me that you're going to sell me your birthright, and I'll give you all the stew you want to. That, ding, 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 all the light bulbs in your head should have went off then. And should have, you, you, wait, 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 wait. I'm an expert hunter. Remember I said highlight it, underline it, because it, I, it, contrary to him being expert at sneaking up on animals and being able to, you know, God, I, I, I don't believe that they had guns during this particular time. Most of the time, most likely they had bow and arrows and things of that nature. And so during this particular time, he had to know how to sneak up on an animal and be able to shoot that bow and arrow. Okay. Whatever the case was, however he was able to get the arrow, he had to be an expert in how to sneak up on them. You are so, uh, you are so wise in how to deal with animals that you dumb when it knows how to deal with humans. What is wrong with you, Esau? You're supposed to be an expert. So you should have known that Jacob was pulling a fast one over you. The dude asked about your birthright and it has nothing to do with food. Unfortunately, that's the same thing that happens in our everyday life. That's the same thing that happens with some of us. That the enemy said, if you do this, yeah, I'll get that. Uh -huh. I'll let you have a good time. I promise you, you're going to have a good time. But make sure you do this thing right here. It's almost like selling your soul to the devil. And and, and the Lord is like, no, 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 no. We, we get uh, we, we get calls, you know, when people scam. Uh, unfortunately, in today's time, there are a whole lot of 
scabbers and schemers and things of that nature. So one of the most popular ones that they're doing now is they'll send you a text message, okay? And the text message says, you know, you need to verify your account information because we saw, uh, yeah, verify your account information. Click on this link to do so. That's a scam. That is a scam. I can tell you at the financial institution that I work, we will not send you a text message like that that says click this link to verify that uh, you'll verify your account information, particularly because you have to sign up in order to get a text message from us in the first place. If you never signed up to get a text message from us, what makes you think that we're going to send you a text message saying that your account has been, you know, that you need to verify your account information? No, that ain't us. No, I'm sorry. That's a scam. And the, and the enemy is scamming folks all the time because he's saying, if I, you know, just like he scammed E when he said, well, did the Lord really say that you would die? Or did he say that, you know, you would get sick or what have you? Did he say you were really going to die? Yeah, I think you'll be all right if you eat of the fruit. If you eat the fruit of this particular tree right now, I, it'll be all right. You're not going to die. Yes, you are going to die. But you, yeah, but he looked at it and said, oh, man, it does look kind of good. And so let me get some of that fruit. Let, let me go and bite into it. The same thing happens with Esau. Esau. You so silly, man. Just come on, dude. What a birthright got to do with a pot with a pot of stew. And you allowed your brother to trick you, and you the one that's supposed to be the answer expert. Something wrong with that. Something wrong with that picture. Something is wrong with that picture. And so uh, you gave up I, I, he gave up a life. Lord blessing for a temporary fix. Cut a be more careful. You let you, you gave up a life law blessing for a temporary fix. What is wrong with you, dude? Who does that? Shame, shame, shame. Lord have mercy, Jesus. Now we're gonna uh, pick back up. There on next week. Uh, actually, we're going to move over uh, to chapter number 32 uh, on next week. And I pray you'll be able to join us as we continue to talk about Abraham's call, Abraham's family. Because at this point, it's like, well, I, I, Abraham, I don't know what your family was thinking. Oh, it ain't looking so good, bro. I don't know. If that promise gonna be fulfilled or not, cause yeah, right now, oh, it ain't looking so good for you. Nah, I don't know if it's gonna work out for you, not, bro. But we'll see what happens. And I pray you join us on next week. Next Wednesday is the first Wednesday of November. It's not only the first Wednesday, but it happens to be the second. Thirty first is on Monday, first day. November the second. On next Wednesday, and I pray you will join us. Uh, no, 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 no. Is it November second? I'm sorry, November the November second. That just don't seem right. Wait a minute, y'all. It's not November the second. Lord have mercy. November the second on next Wednesday, and I pray you will uh, be able to join us right here at seven o'clock p.m. This coming Sunday morning. We will be here in person and online, and we invite you to come and join us at 1045 a.m., whether it is in person or online. Don't forget, early voting is happening right now. Right now, early voting is happening uh, every day, uh, Thursday and Friday of this week. Excuse me, polls will close at 7.30 p.m. all next week, Monday through Friday. 
Polls will open at 8 o'clock and close at 7.30. And you want to make sure that you check for the county in which you reside, in which you are registered to vote, as to if they are open on this coming Saturday, this coming Sunday, and on Saturday, November the 5th. You want to make sure that you check that out, particularly if you're going to participate in early voting. The general election will take place on Tuesday, November the 8th. I would encourage you to make sure you exercise your right to vote so that we can be a part of this process in, in choosing the leaders that shall govern over us and shall make the decisions that we have to abide by because we live in this particular uh, world called the United States of America. And so we want to find ourselves being a part of that voting process uh, so that we can uh, participate accordingly. Amen. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the importance of, of relying and trusting in you and having a relationship with you so that, Lord, that we don't get outsmarted by the devil. We don't get outsmarted by his cutting ways, by his trickery, Lord. We pray, God, that you would continue to keep us in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, let me spe pray a special prayer, God, and as a mass shooting has happened in uh, Raleigh just on last week, God, and then there was a, a shooting that, or uh, actually in the last two weeks, and then there was a shooting of six people being injured, including children, uh, just the other day uh, in Durham, Lord, I pray, God, excuse me, in Oxford, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to keep us safe. The Lord, touch the minds and the hearts of those that are committing these crimes, Lord, those that are committing these senseless shootings and killings. I pray that you will touch their minds, God, touch and pierce their hearts in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We magnify you and we lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray and count every single thing done. And all those that believe say, Amen. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit. Forever I pray in fathomless billows of love. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever I pray. In fathomless pillows of love.